Shadow puppets. Do you remember what shadow puppets were? I don't know if kids today, you know, I don't see anything concerning shadow puppets anymore. I guess because everything's so electronic and so, you know, they just got all this handed to them. But back in the day, and I was really pathetic at shadow puppets, I couldn't even do a rabbit. You know, that's when you have the lights off, you have a light behind you and you shine. Usually we did shadow puppets when we were sleeping out, if you were camping, because on the roof of the tent, as you're laying there, you got your flashlight and you can start making your, your shadow puppets. And I remember some people, they could do Winston Churchill really good, you know, and even having him smoking a cigar, though you can't see the smoke going up. But the shadow puppets were really cool back in the day. And the interesting thing about shadow puppets is the shadow... You know, you can look at that shadow and, and then you say, OK, what's creating shadow? Because the person that's doing the puppet doesn't want you to see because they don't want you to be able to do it because it's their trick. But it for forces you to look at the person's hands. And I think too often, well, in the spiritual realm, the shadow is the Old Testament, which points to the Christ. But too often we see the shadow and we turn and we look at the physical, which is the Old Testament. But you're supposed to look past that object, which is creating the shadow, and you're supposed to look at the sun. And that's who you're supposed to focus in on. And too often we're focusing in on the shadow, the, the, the physical object. And I think when we do that, it gets us off track. And we need to stay on track. The church is a living entity, like the word of God, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, living and active, sharpening a two-edged sword. It can't just sit still. It's kind of like what James was saying, you know, you got to get out of your comfort zone. Maybe that's why Paul uses the, the, that word walk, because when you're walking, you're not sitting in your comfort zone. You're going forward. And in my study with Song of Solomon, chapter one, I think verse three, the, the thing that I was discussing with Jeff this week is, she says, let us run together. You know, Paul talks about walking with Christ. In Song of Solomon, she's talking about running. Like, you know, and when you're running, you've got the wind in your face and you're going forward. There is no comfort zone to running. Especially if you go running downhill, right? Because you're just kind of watching everything that's going on. Don't worry about mistakes. Don't worry because you're running with Christ. The church needs to learn to run and not get stuck in its comfort zone. And the challenge is, well, to get out of a comfort zone, it was mentioned that there's a lot of pain. And pain is a very good thing because you don't gain anything without suffering pain. So says weightlifters. So says parents, husbands and wives. You, you have a really big fight, but you had to get the fight out there. You had to go through that pain so that you, you vented the problem and now you, you talked about it. And now, okay, that pain is over with. Now we can go forward because I never knew you thought that way. And you never knew I thought that way. So that kind of pain is something we have to, we don't like it, but we've got to endure it. And it's not because you put me through this or I purposely put you through that. It's just because. And, and that's where the church needs to be. It can't just be rigid and say, no, you can't do that. No, I'm not going to change, you know? And you can never be a, afraid to approach and just admit okay what well, you know i'm just not catching on to what you're putting down here this is not doing anything for me i am struggling here because when you look at these screens we've got about 60 people some people are picking up what's going down really nicely other people can't pick it up and we can't address everybody's needs every Sunday morning. But if 
your needs are not getting met. If you mention them, then they will get met. If you mention the struggle you're going through, then maybe the church can grow and overcome its blindness. So it's very important. We as brothers and sisters, as a family, we, we, we share our struggles together. And the sermon comes because one person was struggling and I, I don't know it. But because that person was brave enough to share that struggle, it makes me re-examine some scriptures and it makes me re-examine some of my attitudes towards the scriptures and opens my eyes to maybe, maybe there's some important areas of life that we're missing. Like the Bible is an incredible book and it, it, it deals with all aspects of life. It's not something you can just simply put down in, in, a, in, a, in a statement and put it on a website and say, this is what we're about, you know. No, we're, we're flexible, we're moving, we're growing. Families change. And we need to understand that. And we need to be aware of that. And we all have to contribute. So your voice is, is absolutely important for the help of the church to grow. So today I want to look at, not shadow puppets, because I'm useless at that. I want to look at the life of John the Baptist. And then I want to draw some really interesting insights from him that I think you probably didn't notice and then take that and come up with an idea and then give you a homework assignment. Homework. <laughs> yes, you got a homework assignment. Okay. John the Baptist shows up about 700 BC. His name's Isaiah and Isaiah starts to write concerning this messenger that's going to show up. As a matter of fact, in, in Mark chapter 1, 2, and 3, uh, he's quoting right out of Isaiah, right? In, in verse 2, uh, as it is written, Isaiah the prophet, behold my messenger, uh, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way? You know, 750 years before Christ shows up? Wow, right? Or 700 years. Then Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, 450 BC. Now he's talking about Elijah the prophet. And Jesus confirms that in, in Mark chapter 9, verse 11. And as a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 1, and I've never noticed this before, but Zechariah focuses in on it. When he, at the temple, now here's the first wave that the people see in Jesus, well, just before Jesus' time, that something's going to take place because after Malachi, there's absolute silence from God. There is no prophets. He is the last. Old Testament, the shadow points to there's a Messiah coming. And sorry, we need to stay focused on, on, on that, watching for. So Zechariah standing in front of the altar of incense, which is the prayers going up before God, Gabriel shows up and, and what does he say? Verse 17, you're going to have a child. And it is he who goes as a forerunner before the Messiah in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make a people prepared for the Lord. Your son is going to be the forerunner. He's going to announce. He's going to meet. He's going to see the Messiah. The time is now at hand, and it's all going to start through you. Zacharias must have been just beside himself. So he's going to tell everybody, right? He's just going to go blab like crazy. Well, this isn't the time. And as a matter of fact, you're just going to be muted here, right? God just hits the mute button right there. And Zacharias, that's it. He can't say a word. And so when he goes out, because he took so long, everybody knows he had a vision and he can't talk. And for a man not to talk, he doesn't fake that. Like men just have to blab all the time, especially if he's going to have a child, right? He wants to tell everybody about it, especially if that child's going to be a child working for God. So he's silent. But everybody knows. So like there's the first rock in the puddle. The ripples are starting to go out. And then a year later, um, so that was 5 BC. A year later, 4 BC, then the, the, this child is born. And he still can't talk until he writes down. 
His name is John. John means Jehovah is gracious. And, and now he, his mouth is open and he begins praising God. And he talks about that he is going to be the forerunner. He mentions that in where someplace in Luke chapter one, around verse 74, 75, you go, you go discover that. And now everybody's talking because it's a time for the Messiah. Everybody's getting excited. And then a year later, Jesus' parents bring him to the temple uh, to, to do the sacrifice for his cleansing when he was 40 days old. And Simeon holds up the child and says, this is the salvation now everybody's just bubbling. You just got to understand, 400 years of silence, the Romans are repressing the people. They're crying out to God. It's almost like the time of Moses when they were under the oppression of the, the Egyptians and the people were just crying out, especially when they started killing the babies. So this is a really an exciting time starting to happen, right? And then 2 B.C., because it's not really going anywhere yet. It's still just little ripples. The Magi show up from the East. Everybody's getting excited. And then Herod goes, kills 20 babies, and everybody's going, what in the world? Did he succeed? What happened? And then there's quiet until Jesus shows up when he's 13 years old at the temple. I'm not sure how much that, that probably sent ripples through the priesthood when they had this 13 year old boy for five days in the temple and they were just astonished at what he was able to do. And then another 17 years of quiet. And then it's in 26 AD, Luke chapter three, that John shows up probably on his birthday, his birthday, I believe to be the day of atonement when the high priest once a year goes into the Holy of Holies to get forgiveness, that's when John went down to the Jordan and started preaching the, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Well, he started to preach baptism, right? Verse three, he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then we see another quote right there of Isaiah. So that's in September, okay? 26 AD, he begins his ministry, the forgiveness of sins through baptism. Everybody's coming. Everybody's coming. And then Jesus shows up. Now, this is kind of interesting. I'm going to go off on a tangent for a second here, but Jesus shows up and it's early February. And we know it's the approximate time because he begins his ministry at the Passover. So that was in April. And we know his travels between there and his baptism because he had 40 days he was in the wilderness right so we can place it about february to make it so that he's his ministry is starting at the passover but just a couple of weeks back i don't know what the date is the 24th maybe last week you know i've got my calendar down here that i would keep looking at because that's the clock and i'm just running out of time but that's okay because it's a really good sermon so if we go to one o'clock you'll be fine you know don't worry, you're at home. You don't have to travel. But, oh, the Russians. The Russians are coming. The Russians believe that Jesus was baptized January 16th. So just type in um, Russian uh, epiphanies. They have these special pools made where they go down into the water, baptize themselves three times, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and, and this is the day that Jesus was baptized. And it is 10 below, it's 20 below, and these guys are out there. And I, I couldn't understand. And you can get videos, and it's all over Russia, the Ukraine. And I thought, you don't see anything like this so much. And it's a, it's a holiday. And I thought, in Russia? You know, I thought it was communist. And then I looked it up, 85% of Russians believe in God. And I said that to Kathy and Bree last night. Bree says, well, duh, dad. They're a communist country. They, they, they live in terror. Their only hope is to be spiritual. Their only hope is to turn to God. And 75% of Russians are Russian Orthodox. I just thought that was really fascinating that people in such a state are 
leaning towards God. And I can accept January 16th as Jesus' baptism. It still fits. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about John the Baptist. His whole life is prepared to what? Introduce the world to Jesus. And he's down and he's baptizing, 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 right? He's got, a, he's got a small army. He's got all these disciples. Here comes Jesus down into the water and he's going, I can't baptize you. And Jesus says, well, for all righteous, for righteousness sake, let's do this. So he does it because he does it to introduce Jesus to the world. But here's the thing you don't think about. As soon as Jesus comes up out of the water, the spirit guides him to go off into the wilderness for 40 days. Here's John. My whole purpose in life is to introduce you to the world. Where'd you go? <laughs> he's, he's nowhere to be found. And, and now all, all, the, all his guys, he's saying, you know, yeah, I baptized him. Oh, well, John, where is he? I don't know. <laughs> like, and then you drop down to John chapter one. Jesus, now in John chapter one, Jesus is coming back from the temptation of Satan. And the next day he saw Jesus the next day, because he, the day before the Pharisees were questioning as to whether or not he was the Messiah or the prophet or the Elijah, right? And he's saying no to all of this. But the next day he saw Jesus coming, right? Oh man, he's so excited. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now he can make his big statement because now Jesus has finally shown up. And the next day, what does he do? He's got two of his disciples and he looks at Jesus as he walks by and he says, behold, the Lamb of God. Whoa. So it's he's only seen Jesus now for two days after the 40 days that he was gone. And his best two disciples take off after Jesus, Andrew and, G and John. And Jesus says, what do you seek? They say, where are you staying? Come follow me. And they come back and they go find their brothers because they say, we have found the Messiah. This is who John's been talking about. We finally got him. Now, here it, here's John all excited. And then what happens? Jesus takes his top two disciples and four other guys that were probably pre-disciples because he's got six guys and he goes north to a wedding. What's John doing? I'm baptizing. Where's he going? I thought. And then after the wedding, he goes to Capernaum, moves his mom to Capernaum, goes along the seashore, picks up the guys, because they went back to fishing, goes down to Jerusalem to do his Passover. Now he's going to begin his ministry. All the while, John's out here baptizing, wondering what in the world is going on. You got to put yourself in, in John's shoes. And now Jesus, John chapter 2, cleanses the temple, runs into Nicodemus. And now it's been, it's probably about Mar April 6th. So it's been another 20 days he hasn't seen Christ. And now Jesus shows up. Well, oh, this is great. Now we can get down to business, right? And, you know, uh, John chapter 3, 22. After these things, Jesus, his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them baptizing. John was baptizing in Anon and near Salim because there was much water there, and the people were coming to him being baptized. And for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with the Jew about purification. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing, and all are going to him. 
And John said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, I must decrease. Now John's excited. This is the reason I came, introduce. And now Jesus is going to get down to work and he's going to start baptizing. And this is wonderful because we're going to build an army because that's what the Old Testament teaches. When the Messiah comes, he'll be the king. He will rule the world. The mindset of the Jews of that time. That's why Jesus says to the apostles a little bit later on, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. What's the leaven of the Pharisees? That the Messiah comes and establishes a world kingdom. He'll drive out the Romans. He'll conquer the world. That's how John's thinking. We're building an army. Now look at verse chapter 4, verse 1. In the same book, John. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, his disciples were. He left Judea and went away into Galilee. And now Jesus leaves. And that's because when they heard this was going on, it's recorded in Mark, someplace in Mark, where, where? chapter one, in Mark, chapter one, verse 14, they come and arrest John, right? Yeah, Mark chapter one, verse 14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus went into Galilee preaching the gospel. John doesn't record, in, in the gospel of John, doesn't record that John got arrested. But John gets arrested as Jesus leaves, right? And he goes up to Galilee. So it really is important to see John's mindset here, right? Where am I in my notes here? Yeah, so Jesus goes back to Galilee. John gets arrested. So John is all excited because now the Messiah is here and he's going to build the army. And it doesn't matter that I've been arrested. So where, what does Jesus do? Well, he doesn't go up to Galilee to start baptizing. That's the point. And that's where I want to bring you to. Because Jesus goes up, Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, well, verse 23, Jesus was going through all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of sickness, every kind of disease among the people. News about him spread throughout all Syria. They brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases, pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Jesus now is focused on what? He's focused on teaching and healing. That's what he's focused, focused in on. No longer baptizing, right? Even when the paralytic comes down through the roof of his mother's house, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And he proves by getting him to get up and take his mat and walk. He proves to everybody that all he has to do is say, your sins are forgiven. Right? He doesn't have to be baptizing at that time. Now, don't get me wrong. Okay? So, what happens? Well, John's in jail. And his ideas aren't working out here. Herod had arrested him to protect him from his wife because of. And in Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus had, verse 1, when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his, oh, verse 2. Now, when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples. And he said to him, are you the expected one? Or should I be looking for somebody else? Now, what's going through John's mind? Well, because John's building an army. And he wants his guys out baptizing this army. And Jesus is supposed to be doing that. That's the focus. And you're not doing. What are you doing? You're running around talking to people and you're healing people. Well, you know, I mean, is John hearing that? Well, Jesus says to the disciples, 
Uh, go report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have, the gospel preached them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Wow. So, so what you're saying is there's a little bit more here than meets the eye. There's a little bit more than just this thing called baptizing. Jesus is really focused on healing. Baptism is important. You, you got to be baptized. Acts 2.38, you know, to get into the kingdom. But it's not more important than teaching and healing. And what I'm thinking here is that sometimes we in the church have a tendency to put the emphasis on one and not the other to the detriment of the other. Do, is our attitude, uh, are we a warship? All guns bla bla blazing away. Do some people have got the nickname Bible thumpers? That was a big popular nickname for, well, some churches down in the States because they just beat people with the Bible. Are we that worship or are we a hospital ship? Do, do people come to us with, with, with perfect health? Matthew chapter 11, 28 says, come to me all you who are weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. I will, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Where's the rest? You know, we, you, you look to the past, you study the scriptures for, for, to strengthen your faith. Faith is built on the assurance of things, right? Hope for. We look to the future with hope. So we bring people in with the faith and we point to the hope because there's going to be a judgment day. There's going to be a day when you die. That's good stuff. But do we spend any time with each other in the presence, in the present? Because the present is love. The greatest of these is love. Faith is past. Hope is future. Love is present. And in the present, what Jesus was showing is you need to be there to help people, especially to heal, to recover, to survive. Do we just bring them in and push them right back out into the world and say, well, you know, you just need to go do this and you just need to go do that? Or are we here to help? heal do we know how to help brethren to heal in teaching song of solomon i love the book obviously he talks about you are a well of water springing up that's the word of god within you which jesus talks about to the woman at the at the at the well but he also says you're being fed by the streams of Lebanon. It's the worldly teachings. I encourage people to go to the younger generation. Go to university. Take God with you, of course. Take God with you wherever you go, but be well grounded. But there's important stuff that, that as the world's growing in understanding, and we can learn from that understanding, go to the scriptures and see what God, God's already saying it. We just need to learn to speak the language. We need to see what God is really saying. And the more we learn... The, the, the greater understanding. It's not like the scriptures are behind. The scriptures are way ahead. And in this world, there is this thing called PTSD. Talking to Todd, his dad had it. Todd lives up in Sudbury. And his dad struggled with it. When people came back from the war, they didn't understand PTSD. They thought people were cowards. Nowadays, we start to understand PTSD, post-trauma, stress disorder. Policemen get it. Children get it. Lots of people struggle with it or some version thereof because they've gone through some major trauma in their lives. And 
it used to be ignored, but now they're starting to say, wait a second, these people, we can give them help. And one of the neatest things that they do is cognitive behavior therapy, which is a type of talk therapy. They call it psychotherapy. Well, you need to understand psych is soul. It's soul therapy. What is God all about? Soul therapy, the Bible. It's about your soul and the healing of your soul. So this thing called CBT helps people become aware of inaccurate, now catch this, inaccurate or negative thinking so you can view challenging situations more clearly and respond to them in a more effective way. So you bring them in and you start to teach them, okay, you have the wrong perspective. You have the wrong understanding. So we correct that and we give you tools so that when you get into a certain situation, you know how to deal with this certain situation. So we get you to come in and, and, and we have a talk session. We come in, you can have a group session. We educate, we prepare you. And CBT is, is set up so that it's, it's not going to last forever because they're, they're, they train the person so that he can deal with things that have happened in the past. So he's got wrong perceptions. Well, don't tell me that's not what the Bible is about. People come to the church because they have totally wrong perceptions. The word repent means to turn 180 degrees and start walking that way, walking with that purpose. Wow, that is, you know, major change in their lives. And I, I, I like to talk about the three-year program. Three years, Jesus was teaching the apostles. He took the persecution. They were watching. Go to the Gospels and watch how many crazy statements Peter makes. Like he, you go, Peter, how can you say something so foolish? But they're learning and they're coming out of, right? They're coming out of the darkness of the Old Testament teachings by the Jews. And now Jesus is shining the light where they've never seen before. And he works with them for three years. And then when he ascends on high, the, the apostles teach the church for three years. People stayed after they got baptized on the day of Pentecost. They stayed for that three years because they needed help. They needed healing. And it's not physical. It is they do not understand the scriptures well enough. Right? What did I say? So that helps you become aware of inaccurate or negative thinking. So you can challenge, so you can view challenging situations. After that first three years, persecution broke out. Everybody scattered. They went right back to, because now they were ready. And then you've got Paul becoming a Christian and disappearing to Arabia for three years. Do you think Paul had some PTSD? He was killing Christians. He had the scriptures backwards in his understanding. Christ himself was the only one that would be able to teach Paul. And Christ taught Paul three years in Arabia before he's able to, what? To be healed enough that he could go out and challenge and be over that fact that it was his fault that how many people died. But God helped him through that. Timothy, three years from his baptism before Paul showed up in Lydia and said, hey, you're strong enough. Come with me. We can do this. And he goes off in the second missionary journey. We do, a, I think we do a great job of teaching. But do we teach from the right perspective? That's what I'm challenged to change how I'm looking at this. Is it simply historical? Is it practical? It, you know, the one word that came to me this morning was holistic. Are we teaching everything? Are we, are we teaching, not so people themselves can teach, but are we teaching so people can heal? Am I pointing out that this scripture is set up for your healing? And when you understand that and put it into practice, you're going to be able to use that to show somebody else how they can heal using scripture. And when people see the incredible value 
of God's word, how it helps heal, how it helps me to refocus, get the right world perspective, how I can deal with things in the world, right? And how about the attitude of preventive maintenance? What am I talking about? Spiritual CBT for your spiritual PTSD. And let me tell you, I had a ton of PTSD. I came out of a world of drugs. I came out of a world this guy was trying to kill me into the church. And you know what? All I got taught was church doctrine. But church doctrine, don't get me wrong, is important. It's not what I needed. They didn't understand that. I've been here for a long time and I'm not teaching CBT. Why? I didn't understand it until somebody said, I'm really hurting. And your lessons aren't reaching me. Well, they're not designed to reach you because he's not aware, the teacher's not aware of the power of the scriptures. It's not to teach you to teach others. It's to teach you to heal. When you experience the healing, you're going to teach others. Because you're going to know that this is God working in your life. And the church has to grow and answer questions. And if, if you don't challenge the church, it's not that the church is wrong. It's that the church is unaware. And when the church can be, have their eyes, we weren't, we didn't understand PTSD until probably the 80s. CBT is really relatively new, 30 years new. The church does teach this material, but we don't put it together in that kind of a format so that you go, oh, you know, forgiveness, baptism is, you know, we think that's the, the, the cure all, but it's not. It's the beginning. But baptism, you get all your sins forgiven. And I had an incredible list of sins when I came to the church. And when I got baptized, I was feeling like walking on air. But I wasn't healed. I was just beginning. First, what, First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin, live in right, in, to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. By his wound, the healing begins. And you know, and I've taught James more than once, huh, but I never understood James chapter 5, verse 16. Or I never stressed James chapter 5, verse 16, the way it should be stressed. See, that's the difference. It's, it's the perspective. Why are you teaching this? So they can teach or that they can learn to be healed. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. You're praying for another person helps your personal healing, not to mention their healing. But I, I, I went on to teach verse 17, Elijah, then 18, but forgot to camp on 16. And that one little verse has such that one little verse has such incredible power. And if the teacher doesn't slow down and focus in on Matthew 6, do not be worried about what your life is, what you're going to eat, drink, your body, what you're going to put on. Look at the birds. The scripture is full of healing teachings from Christ from Paul that I think we haven't learned to pull it together to recognize. I mean, Romans, we were talking about Romans with James class today. I love the end of chapter 12, you know, don't pay back evil for evil, respect what is right. Never take your own revenge. Leave room for the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Do not be overcome by, overcome 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't hold grudges. Be totally forgiving. Don't let what somebody else do fill you full of his garbage. Learn from the scriptures. How can I now spend time not saying, how am I going to get revenge? No, no, I should be spending time and how can I pour out God's love into his life? That's what God wants you to do. If you don't, if you all you do is figure out revenge on another person, you just fill up on the negativity. You just fill up on the hate. He doesn't know what you're thinking. The only one that knows what you're thinking is God. And it's just eating you. It's not freeing you. What God teaches is absolutely vital to your personal health. It's one thing to read it. But the important thing is to practice. I've got to make it real. I can't have one person that I really hate. No, I, all my enemies. How about purpose for living? So many people don't understand purpose. What's Genesis for? Just how God created the world? No. Genesis shows that God loves us so much that he created the world. He created man. And then you look at Cain. We're here for, we're, our purpose is to be our brother's keeper. Our purpose is to help other people to make it to eternity. God's put eternity in the hearts of people. What is my purpose? That's my purpose. Genesis gives me a better world perspective, right? Why, why does Jesus say love the brethren? Because you know it's super easy to hate the brethren. It is. Because I, I say this so much. Because we come from different worlds, with different backgrounds, different likes. It's easy to love your neighbor. But he's saying, learn to love the brethren and you will set yourself free from all your foolishness. Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from selfishness, empty conceit, humility of mind, regard who regard the brethren, one another, as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but the interests of others. What did psychiatrists say to a person that's struggling with depression? Get out and go help somebody. What does God say? Get out and go help somebody. Get out and go help your brother. I don't know what he needs. Well, then get on the phone and go for a coffee. Get on the Zoom and just talk, sharing coffees over a great distance. Do you even know your brother? Are you spending time? You know, <laughs> when I came into the church, I memorized eight, ten, ten. I don't think I could repeat them now, but I might be able to. Ten, ten different verses on baptism. That's what I learned. Memorize this stuff. Why? Because we're going to put you out there. But I was never taught to memorize Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Self-talk. Don't beat yourself up. Dwell on these things. Self-talk's a big one with CBT. There's, there's just a world to explore making application from the scriptures. Climate change. Oh, now, don't get me started on climate change. And you'll probably totally disagree with me on climate change, but we don't have to agree with it. But we do have to agree on one thing. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, which the heavens will pass away with the roar. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burnt up. God's going to take care of this world. There's this thing called Judgment Day, and when it happens, Satan's going to gather his forces, surround the church, and then what? God's fire is going to come down and take them away. Oh, so Satan and his forces aren't going to hurt me, are they? No, they're not. That's what God's promised. Get God's word here. Use it to help get rid of the anxieties and the fears as you see this world going crazy. Do we need to do our best to help climate change? Absolutely. But not to the detriment of other countries, not to the detriment of the poor. No. 
We're not going to preserve this world. Sorry, God's going to eliminate it. What, what's my focus? Not, it's not on climate change. It's on people's hearts changing. It's on me changing my heart. I, I just threw out a bunch of verses there. That if you look at them correctly, they help heal. And I know you've looked at some of these yourself correctly and have started the, to help heal yourself or others. I'm not saying this is all brand new. I'm just saying, and I'm not saying you shouldn't focus on baptism. But I'm thinking Jesus is showing some incredible balance here. And I think in focus on reaching out, we, we lost or never had the focus of reaching in. And because Pentecostal churches will say, well, just come on in and we'll just lay our hands on you and heal you. And this man is a healer and he can heal you. No, we don't have anybody that can do that. We don't believe in physical healings by a man. We believe in physical healings by God. That's why we pray and we ask God to intervene. And when that person gets a healing that the doctors are just amazed at, we give thanks to God. But there is also this mental, spiritual healing. That's the part that I think I miss. And I need to focus in more on. I would really like to have a, a bunch of studies that said, you know, I remember Leith asking me one time, what about lonely hearts? Well, there, there should be a study in the scriptures. Like I, I just, it does. Some things just don't enter this thing here, right? Because I'm a man. That's my excuse. And over time, we start to listen more, maybe because I'm getting older, feeble, I don't know. But we have to learn to listen more. I know I have to learn to listen more. Maybe there's some really good scriptures that'll help with loneliness. Maybe there's whole books that will help with loneliness, anxiety, obsessions. I'm, I'm obsessive compulsive, right? So... I'm not saying that when we look at people, they're coming in and they're just totally neurotic or, you know, but I think we need to help them to see how they can deal with certain struggles they're having so they can see how they can help heal themselves because they're coming from a world of darkness. They're coming from a world of PTSD because they weren't thinking correctly because you came from a world, you weren't thinking correctly. You hear stuff in the scriptures. I've never thought about that. That happens all the time. We're all struggling. But if we can just at least get into the conversation, that's the point of the lesson here. If we can learn to talk about what is struggling, not about why. It's not a blame game. It's let's help the church to grow so that when our children are going to church they'll understand what healing truly is all about because when i look backwards over time i went to a preaching school for three years they never taught me about healing they avoided the conversation they just wanted me to understand we're a warship they never helped me to understand we're a hospital ship we've been looking at shadow puppets and in those shadow puppets we have a tendency to look at the, the thing that makes the shadow and all i'm saying is we need to look past the thing that makes the shadow we need to look directly at the sun and he will open our eyes to understanding when we look around within the body i don't know anyone in this body that doesn't hurt and struggles with something it would be really neat if we could learn to get some scriptures so that when I'm struggling with something, I, I just need to go here and find it. If I'm struggling with something, I just need to go talk to somebody. Because with CBT, one of the biggest things is, is just getting together with somebody. Do you have a prayer partner? Are you talking to any, are you confessing your sins so, so healing can begin? You know, it's that, those kinds of things that I want to bring up in the future that'll help us to grow. 
you don't grow from a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night. You grow from being a Christian all week long. And it takes three years to get people before they're out pounding streets. And I'm not saying you need to pound streets. But when you understand how healing the scriptures can be, you're going to share that with other people. And when they start to see that, then they're going to say, how do I become a part of the body of Christ? Oh, yeah. So I said, oh, good. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Homework. Mail in, email me verses that help you and why they helped you. See, we all have some. We all understand this to a little. But if we pool our thoughts, I think we can come up with some really good material for loneliness, for anxiety. And we can get some really good discussions. Yeah, yeah, baptism was important. But John John didn't see that what Jesus came He was focused on the teaching and the healing. And we need to remember the teaching and the healing and not lose sight of, I think, you get a healthy congregation going, you're going to have healthy growth. But if we don't take care of each other, nothing's going to happen. And I'm guilty of missing sight of that. And we need to keep challenging each other to open our eyes to that. Growth comes from pain and we need to open our eyes. But then James was also saying, we need to change. And change is a good thing. That's my lesson. Thank you for listening.